Don't get me wrong, I loved making lore videos and I especially loved playing Oxenfree. The engaging chat system that requires you to talk for every interaction, the relationships you build with the characters which feel very personal, and the replayability value. But this game has multiple endings, secrets, and hidden messages which, if you aren't meticulous enough, could easily be missed. But Oxenfree 2 Lost Signals is finally out, so I want to give people an in-depth analysis as to what the whole story actually means. So let's get into the lore of one of my favourite horror games ever made, Oxenfree. Now, in this game, there are a lot of possible endings you could end up getting. We won't be covering all of them, but I'll guide you through the first playthrough in great detail so that you have a better understanding of the story overall. We begin the story on a ferry with Alex, Jonas, and Ren heading towards Edwards Island, the main location and setting our story will be taking place in. Ren is discussing the island's history and talking about cookies, which a cafe used to sell, before asking us if we're paying attention to the conversation. Alex? Hey, still with us? You haven't said anything for like 10 minutes. I can this is where we are introduced to the dialogue system of the game. Every single interaction will require some input from the player. Alex will usually have three options, along with a fourth option to remain silent. These interactions also act as a form of perspective, to tell us what Alex may be thinking about during each situation. We learn from their interactions that Alex's parents are divorced, and Alex's mother has remarried into a relationship with Jonas's dad, having met on a holiday. He got lost in some gardens and he thought she worked there and blah blah blah, they hit it off. Alex is still adjusting to everything, and this is the first time they're meeting with Jonas, being completely new to the group. On another note, Ren is Alex's childhood best friend. The atmosphere is a little bit awkward, but the three of you take a picture before Ren asks you to take out a radio. Probably the biggest mistake of your life. We tune into a radio station and listen to Ren's band. The three of you then land on the island before Jonas asks for some alone time with you. If you choose to accept, Jonas will talk about how everything feels quite sudden, with moving houses and getting a new family. Family at the same time kind of feels like I'm skipping the training wheels. Potential dialogue options show us that Jonas may have gone to jail and that he has replaced our brother's room located in the attic. Moving up, we see a statue which, upon tuning into a radio frequency near the tour guides around the island, can give us information in regards to the landmarks. We learn that the USS Kanaloa, a submarine, was shot down on October 28th, 1943 by a Japanese subchaser. 85 officers and 12 army passengers were lost in the accident. Going up, we learn that no one else lives on the island except for an elderly woman named Miss Adler. Nobody lives here except for some geriatric named Mrs. Adler. But, as God is my witness, we'll never mention her or any other old person's name again. Ren tells us about the weirdo caves, which with the help of our radio can pick up frequencies to stations that don't exist. Alex is apparently thinking of moving out of town, although she's still thinking about her decision. The dream! Jonas, did you know that a little birdie told me that our Alex here is thinking of going out of state to college? We make our way to the beach where we hear the voices of Nona and Clarissa, two other classmates that Ren invited who can be heard laughing in the distance. Ren admits that he has a crush on Nona and asks us to be cool about it. The situation is awkward as there was an expectation more people would come, and Jonas hasn't even gotten to know the group yet. Where is everyone else? Nicole had that tennis thing. And, uh, who else was supposed to come? Anyone? Everyone? <laughs> oh my god, it's just Alex and her new stepbrother? <laughs> That's it. That's who you brought. Nona seems quite reserved, and Clarissa? Well, we'll call her outspoken. Everyone goes to the beach and a conversation begins. Maggie Adler, the woman who was previously mentioned, ended up dying three days prior. You then begin playing Truth or Slap a game where you have to answer a question honestly, and if someone can prove you're lying, you get slapped. Clarissa asks Ren if he wants to go out with Nona, to which he denies. 
During Clarissa's turn, she asks why our parents got divorced in the first place. We can be truthful, and it's here that we learn about Alex's brother, Michael, who drowned. Died, and it broke everything, and they couldn't handle it. The end. Well, now you know, Jonas. Don't die, and everything will be fine. Okay, Clarissa, you- What? You know guys, honest- The game ends after a bit of tension, and Ren, Alex, and Jonas head over to the cave. Ren gets high from a brownie he brought, and proceeds to teach us how to use the radio. The rocks present in the cave, and all around the island, act as indicators for where the hidden signals can be accessed. We also learn that Alex's brother Michael dated Clarissa before he died, possibly explaining her aggression towards us. Tuning into all three signals will result in a glowing light, which Jonas follows. Following behind, we see the words, See a man about a dog. We can then meet up with Jonas, who, startled by our presence, asks us to move forward. In front of you is the catalyst for the entire game. Jonas notices the floating triangle in the cave, and upon further investigation, we see a locked wardrobe, along with further text reading, Saw the man, but not the dog. Using the radio, we cause the triangle to react in some very strange ways. A triangle of space and time manifests in front of us with a combination of multiple voices intertwined. Uh. This sentence may sound like complete nonsense, but it will be important later on. We are then taken to an ocean abyss where we see a piece of debris fall. Jonas wakes us up, the both of us somehow ending up near the communications tower. Jonas recommends calling for help, and the both of you make your way up. Jonas lockpicks the door, and you investigate the equipment within the tower. Receiving a call from Ren, he mentions waking up and appearing in the woods. Clarissa calls from the other line and claims she's at Fort Milner, the both of them seeming quite unnerved before hanging up. In this instance, I decided to help out Clarissa. Making our way over, I realize that in one of the photos we have saved, there's a picture of Alex and her brother Michael talking to each other. The pictures do end up being more important towards the end of the game, where we see how our decisions impact the story. On our way, Clarissa calls for help. Damn it, is, is this thing working? If anybody can hear me, I'm at Fort Milner in the, uh, I think, crap, I think in the gym or something? Climbing another tower, we see a flickering light, and using our knowledge from the cave, we re-summon the voices. Dinner time! It's never too late to make dessert. Not anymore. <laughs> the voices seem to be mocking, yet playful, forcing us to play a game with them. After getting locked in a room within the fort, we see the first instance of one of the ghosts looking at us through the window. We can turn on the light, allowing us to make it back to Jonas. In the mirror, a reflection of ourselves begins talking to us. The name above Alex's reflection reads something really random. Oh, uh, this game has an online feature. It's another way that the game messes with you. Players who have further progressed into the game will attempt to influence your decisions, which is pretty cool. When the time comes, let Jonas talk to his mom. Jonas snaps a photo of the mirror after we save him, and we move on. The photo in question has the figure we previously saw in better detail. Clarissa then runs off into one of the buildings, and we give chase. Another cool detail can sometimes be seen in the game's subtitles, when a character's name will turn bright green. I never really found a pattern for this, but it can be assumed to be a ghost since Clarissa would not have had time to enter the building and access a radio. You'll find other instances in the game where a character's name turns bright green. The next building is a classroom with a red light and a triangular window, along with handprints on a chalkboard. A voice begins to talk on the radio. Hi in the Cascade Mountains of Washington. The Navy opens the world's largest radio transmitter. Notice the bright green text shown in the subtitles. The ghosts engage with us through a quiz game. What is the name of the school you are standing in? Stand we're standing in. During the second question, we can also see two eyes hiding in the dark. Jonas gets possessed before saying this. We are an island race, and through all our times the sea has ruled our breaks. But be wary, young ones. 
Jonas. His voice sounds distorted after the third question and we can then open up another time anomaly using our radio. The voices confirm that they are in fact the sunken soldiers of the submarine. They say that all they want is time before putting prints all over the chalkboard. Is this... are you the dead officers that sunk on the Canaloa? We are uh, sunken. What... what do you want? For the first time. For the first time. For the first time. Time. Just... Time. Clarissa then proceeds to have the bright green text when she's speaking, indicating that it isn't her talking. Clarissa is happy to see us and shows us the radio she found. The radio unfortunately has too low of a frequency to function outside the base. We then enter our first time loop of the game. Clarissa is seen hanging herself during the first loop. The tape player in front of us during the next loop stops the time loop from occurring. Clarissa, possessed, jumps from the window, killing herself. Oh my god! Why would she do that? Now, going back down, she isn't there. I theorize that these are the ghosts showing us the capabilities of different timelines. At the very least, we have unknowingly entered a different timeline in which Clarissa kills herself. Fortunately for us, Clarissa doesn't actually die, which Alex points out when her body isn't anywhere to be seen. Good news? Yes, Jonas, of course it's good news that Clarissa isn't dead, Christ. After calming down, we make our way over to Ren. You and Jonas can bond by having positive interactions. These are important as they will determine whether you and Jonas will be on good terms by the end of the game. In order to make your way across the bridge ferry, the both of you enter the power station with noticeable triangular windows. In an attempt to turn on the circuit breaker, the lights go out and a red light flickers. Using the radio, a station plays music which Jonas's mother used to listen to. That's... that's... God, I haven't heard this in forever. This is something my mom used to... Call. I am so tired of this funhouse bullcrap. Restoring power, the both of you make it across. In the campgrounds, you enter another time loop. Jonas recalls his trips with his parents to Missouri. He talks about how his parents tried their best to bond with him despite not having much money. You continue repeating time and notice a soccer ball. Kicking it will result in the ball coming back to you before you and the ghosts continue going back and forth. A black stain appears on the wall which, looking carefully, seems to resemble the ghosts in the photographs. This time, Jonas disappears from the loop and we once again receive feedback from an alternate version of ourselves. Tell Michael to stay with Clarissa. They like each other a lot. We can then break the loop using the tape player. Moving on, we encounter Nona who seems to be really afraid of us. She claims to have bumped into us already. Nona refuses to come with us and so we tell her to go to the comms tower. Through the photographs taken of us kicking a ball, we also see this terrifying figure. We can bond further with Jonas and choosing the positive options will further strengthen our relationship. Ren is seen hiding and appears angry at us because we chose to go to Clarissa first. Another time loop occurs and we see Ren move away from us, appearing possessed. Even using the tape player, things seem to go wrong as Ren stands on the edge of the cliff. We can tune into the radio several times in order to help him. The ghosts claim that they would never hurt us and that they are in between. Ren comes back to normal and also claims to have been in a time loop. Why is this happening? I mean, I've been here. I visited this place like 15 times. The island's haunted. Nona attempts to use the comps tower. Ren talks about a time where we skipped an important test to bring him an amp for his band. This was at a stage where Michael had died. Prairie Wait, you blew off an important test to get him an amp? Really? That was a thing you did. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe I would have done things differently now, but, you know, whatever. No one else knows where Clarissa is. Oh, hey guys, I see you down there. And without Clarissa... Every time we hear an intercom, each character claims that the person talking sounds different and weird. Stupid thing. She doesn't sound good, right? She sounds a little off. I don't know her well enough. 
She's probably Which makes sense given that we know that ghosts have the potential to interrupt signals. Ren causes further tension by claiming to have taken a second wheat brownie. Took that second brownie. What? It's kind of, you know, it's just about to Ren, we need you sober right now. We need you capable. How can you be so stupid? Wait, you're not messing with us? You seriously took another one? Regrouping in the tower, Ren claims he knows how to get the keys to Maggie Adler's house using a radio frequency device. His sister had apparently brought the mail to her while she was working on the island. The plan is to get the device and escape through a boat located at the manor. Some more tension occurs when Janice claims that the best option is to find Clarissa and to set fire to a building in order to call for help. Jonas and Ren begin blaming each other for the events taking place. Ren, understand it is completely your fault that we're in this to begin with. What? And now you want us to trust you when things are really bad? Jonas states that we can go to the town and collect the device, but as a backup plan, two people have to remain on the tower. We are then given a major decision in the game to choose who to bring with us. I chose Jonas in this instance, which ended up hurting Ren. Ah, <sighs> thank you. What? First, you let me sweat it out for like two hours in the woods to go gallivanting around with this guy, and now you're still picking him over me? Him? Him. You learn more information from Jonas as he mentions that he's been to juvenile detention. You might have heard that I, uh, went to jail at some point. I never went to jail, but I did beat up a guy and get sent to juvenile detention for it. Why'd you do it? Just... My mom got sick, and then she got real sick, and then this kid, Timmy Finster, threw a baseball at my head, and yes, he was joking, but I don't know, I just popped. Moving back to town, we find Clarissa sitting on a street lamp. We can free her from her possession using the radio, causing her to fall. Through a time loop, Clarissa and the group are teleported to a different part of the town. Clarissa gets into an outburst and not only blames you for being stuck on Edwards Island, but also for Michael's death. Jonas, I swear to God, the town looks at her like she has a red letter tattooed on her freaking Clarissa. forehead. And the giant lit up Christmas tree reason why is that Michael is dead because of her. Alex had apparently asked Michael to take her swimming one last time, where he ended up drowning. The time loop breaks and we return back to the museum. We collect a pocket radio with a higher frequency rate. It's a wall radio that will allow us to open frequency gates. We find a letter from Maggie who informs us that she has been keeping secrets. She then states there are other notes on the island to find. Based on what we hear, she might have been trying to control the time phenomenon, or may have been trying to communicate with the ghosts. You go back in time to when Michael and Clarissa were still dating. Bring a swimsuit. The sun is not out. The sun is... I guess it barely came out just now. But see, this is when I get punished for watching the weatherman. He said it was going to be like overcast. He said there was a chance for clouds. Apparently, visits to Edwards Island were quite frequent. Clarissa acts nicer towards you during this visit. It's a bit unclear why the time disturbances are taking you back to this specific moment in time, but it could be possible that they are a distraction to prevent you from leaving. Michael asks us what we think of Clarissa, and soon after, time returns back to the present. To be there then. It's important to me that you like Clarissa, Alex, so tell me the truth. What do you really think of her? God, do what you want, man. Don't ask me for advice. <laughs> okay. We return to the gate area and meet up with the group. Using the radio, you get the gate to open. The house is huge and has a triangular roof, meaning we can expect some strange things to happen. We manage to enter the house using the radio and find Clarissa. Alex is a bit suspicious as to Clarissa's presence and how she got there in the first place. Get in here. The door was locked. Do you have, like, a radio? No, I don't have a radio. The kitchen window was open. In the attic, we take the boat keys as well as a note telling us to tune into the source, perhaps referring to the cave. Another time disturbance occurs and everyone except for Alex appears to be unconscious. During a conversation with a possessed Clarissa, we see our first instance of the ghosts closely together. Clarissa plays a game that involves us finding objects around a house. If we fail, then our friends begin to disappear. Oops.
Maggie Adler had a friend who helped her contact the ghost named Anna. Something happened to Anna because the ghost attempted to possess her too quickly, resulting in her death. The, the picture of, of, I guess it's Maggie Adler and somebody, is this it? Yes, very nice. That's Margaret Adler and her friend Anna. Accident appears to have made the ghost bitter and resentful. A mirror version of ourselves stands in front of us, giving us advice for future parts of the game. Tell Michael he should go out on his own. Okay, seriously, who are you? Clarissa was taken back to the caves, but according to Nona, the cave entrance has been blocked off. We look through Maggie's basement and search through a film tape and see what Anna and Maggie look like in their youth. The bomb shelter is an alternative way to get into the cave. Considering Maggie's obsession with triangles, it appears the time anomalies generally result in that shape. On the final slide, we learn how to access the shelter, which will require two radios on opposing sides of the island to contact each other. Another vision occurs where we see Ren drowning. We also get possessed for the first time, meaning the ghosts are starting to have an effect on us. Take it easy for a second. You went all red-eyed, like when we get possessed. More objects appear around the island. We enter another loop where we see the corpse of Ren before the ghost shows multiple timelines in which either Ren or Nona are killed. He had an accident. He... he died. I couldn't... What happened? He... he drowned. He took a fall. I don't know. He just... He just stopped. I mean That's when we speak to a possessed Jonas. We are then told that the time loops are of our own making. The ghosts make a deal with us so that if we give the ghost Clarissa as a host, they'll let us go. Take her, let her go, quietly, without fuss. You won't slaughter the rest of your friends, like young Reginald here. They mock Ren's death, indicating that their motive was to pressure us into accepting the deal. The ghosts are taking even more control over Jonas, meaning we don't have much time left. Ren and Nona use the speakers once we return. We enter the station and verify the signal. Being tasked with moving on to the shelter, we make our way to the final part of the game. Jonas gets possessed again, indicating that we're running out of time. I have an idea, Mr. Jordan. He describes it as drowning in his own body. We seem to have also connected closely throughout the events of the game. Jonas mentions something about a concert before we're taken back in time. And I promise it'd be the last time I bring it up tonight, but you know you screwed up with Ashley at the concert, right? I mean, it's not a giant thing, but still. Who's Ash? Oh, you mean Amanda? My really good friend Amanda who's moving away forever, that Amanda? We're being reprimanded by Michael for going with our friend Amanda to a concert. As a result of our previous advice, Michael decides he's going to continue dating Clarissa. Oh, and I wanted to say, um, <laughs> per your advice, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna really, um, like, commit to Clarissa. That sounds dumb, like I'm pinning her or something. Michael feels pressured by the fact that the town sees him as an example of what to strive for. He talks about his uncle moving to town, indicating that he too wishes to leave. <laughs> I cannot believe I had to pick you up from the police station because of Grand Theft Auto. I mean, that is too funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever, man. <sighs> you got, you know, you went bad again? Ren claims that something between Alex and him broke. Either he's indicating that we've changed or that our friendship changed, possibly because the choices I made in the game resulted in our separation as friends. We take one last photo as a group and then enter the bunker with Jonas. We see a tape player despite not being in a time loop. The tape player then plays the tune that Jonas's mother listened to when she was alive. He thinks it's his mother communicating with him as he hears his mother's voice. We are then asked to tune into the signal to better hear her sing. It's... it sounds like it's her. Like a recording, or it's just... it's my mom. That's her voice in the static to change, or... Uh, huh? Oh, uh... Alex? Jonas, wait! 
We can briefly see what appears to be our hometown before Jonas disappears. On our way to the cave, the ghosts say they could have left by their own choice. They don't mean leaving the island, they mean stepping into the abyss that waits for us all when we die. Then just leave then, why are you- why are you still here? Why not move on of all of them? Because it's scary, that's why. Have you ever stared into nothing and moved with it and felt a part in it? It's worse than when we were wilting into atoms. Worse than dying the first time. We once again tap into the radio, causing a significantly larger time disturbance. After being taken into the abyss, we then witness a submarine explosion that resulted in the deaths of the officers. We see one of the ghosts holding up Clarissa. In this part of the game, we have three different choices for three major endings. The first choice is to close the time hole, trapping us forever in a time loop, but allowing our friends to be free. The second is to leave and let the ghost take Clarissa. And the third is to remind the ghosts of their humanity. We find out that Maggie was responsible for the ghost's deaths. The ghosts are further enraged by the fact that the island was turned into a tourist trap soon after the tragedy. We can remind the ghosts of their identity by using one of their names, which we read either through Maggie's letters or hear through the tour guides scattered across the island. There's... I know there was a guy on that submarine named Henry, and just to him, she wanted to help you, alright? She wanted to help all of you. Henry! Was our name ever... Henry? Henry? My name... Henry Griffin. It's hard to remember... Certain things. Our faces went a while ago, then our names... Names. Our names. But our anger... Our anger is... We're afraid of all we have left. Keep your nature. We keep ours. Maggie had, has, will have, this friend, and you sort of remind us of her. Strange girl. Odd-tempered. Take care. With the time you have left, child, and take notice of what you choose to. A weird message is seen in front of us, but I'm unsure what it means, and looking online, I could not find a deciphered text. We can then give future players our own advice, and as you can see, my name appears above Alex. We are essentially giving advice to Alex's in other timelines. We then wake up in our house, presumably back in time to when Michael was still alive. Going up to the attic, he talks about his graduation speech. Also notice the triangular shape of the attic. He talks to us about potentially leaving with Clarissa out of town. In this scenario, I tell him he should go. So, can you just wave your hand over my head or something and say I'm alright to do this? I... God, it's hard for me to say since I love you, of course, but you should do it. Totally. Even if it explodes in a nuclear war style breakup, you'll regret never trying. What I didn't know is that this would significantly impact the ending. He gives us his last piece of advice before he leaves. So... I love you too. But soon, I shall be so I cannot remember any, but the things that never happened. Ren reads out a line from a text. We all left on the boat and had apparently fixed the tear in the triangle. Weirdly enough, faint lines appear in the background forming triangular shapes. We talk about our experience and everyone talks about theirs. Clarissa recalls going back in time to an argument where she had a random encounter with her sister being mad at her. Nona ends up finding a book that was left on the island belonging to Ren. Clarissa even bonds with us and asks us to go dress shopping with her and Nona before the prom. We seem to have maintained a good relationship with her throughout the game. We talk for a bit before taking one last photo. Ren then reads one last quote from Mark Twain. I could remember anything whether it happened or not. But soon, I shall be so I cannot remember any but the things that never happened. Yeah, I... I don't know. Okay, everyone. Wait, didn't you... Cheese! 
The game ends on a slightly creepy note as Ren had already read this line out before having received the book from Nona. In the context of the game, the quote implies that we are recalling and remembering events that haven't technically occurred yet. In the ending I got, Jonas and Alex managed to connect. Ren and Nona didn't end up dating, Nona went to a ballet academy, and we kept out of touch. Clarissa studies English literature, where surprisingly we still keep in touch, but we end up losing contact with Ren. That's when Alex's name appears green. Is she a ghost, or are the last lines of speech being intercepted? Then, in a twist, it turns out Alex is talking about going to Edward's Island, implying that this is before the events of the story take place. <sighs> yeah, sorry, I gotta run or I'll miss the ferry. Ren's dragging me out to Edward's Island for that yearly beach party thing, and I have to pick up what's-his-name Jonas, too. <sighs> I hope he's not weird, or mean, or something. Whatever, I'm sure it'll be fun. It's something to do, right? Now, as mentioned before, this game has a very interesting replayability system, and pretty soon, you'll start piecing together that no matter what you do, this game will always have a horrific ending. Before the second playthrough on the main menu screen, we see the words, Continue Timeline. More glitches are seen throughout the second playthrough of the game. A text option appears that shows Alex recognises subtly the occurrence of repeating events. Throughout the game, Alex can also finish unknown sentences that she hasn't been told about yet. Back in my head since I woke up this morning. But, oh, oh, actually, it's after 10 o'clock, which means my dear friend and his buddies are probably just touching down on Edward for the yearly bash on the beach or whatever we call it now. But anyways, I promised him that I'd play a song from the band, so... Hello? Hello, anybody out there? Uh, out. We hear static this time when we connect to the radio station before hearing ourselves talk. Alex seems to be the only one to notice the last part of the audio. When we land, we can also predict what Jonas will say, which leaves him a little bit hurt. I'm up and meet your friends. Uh, really? No, Jonas, I, I have a feeling I know what you're gonna say, and it's fine. Yeah, it's weird us living together now, but it's okay. Let's just meet up with our friends. Oh, um, okay. Sure. More glitches occur during our progression to the beach area, and the rest of the events go on as normal. During the tuning of the signal, we see a weird symbol. We end up seeing a radio in the cave, which wasn't there before in our first playthrough. Alex states that there should be something else located here, referring to the floating triangle in our first playthrough. The ghosts speak to us before we can even tune into the signal. When we do tune into the signals, the ghosts address us with recognition. The ghosts identify that we're in a time loop, always cursed to repeat the exact same events. The ghosts talk about reaching another Alex, once again identifying the multiple timelines. Let's try and understand this message. Bobtail refers to a dog or a horse whose tail is cut short, whilst a shaved tail is a derogatory term used for newly commissioned military officers. It is also the name of a missile rocket, giving it a double meaning. Throughout the letters we find later, we can identify that Maggie was a newly commissioned communications officer whose actions resulted in the destruction of the submarine. Bobtail could be referring to the ghost whose lives were cut short, while she Shave tail might be referring to Maggie. Sleepy time gal is a little bit too vague for me to dissect, however. Jonas and you talk about alternative realities. This time I decided to contact Ren first since he seemed to be more sensitive about our choice. Alex and Jonas also recognize the flash for the first time in the game. Then drown us, but not, and now we're here. Wait, what just happened? I feel like, I don't know, I got a flash of something. No, I, I feel kind of weird too. In the woods, we skip a lot of the forest and somehow end up near the end of the area. Sitting on the chair, something different ends up happening to us and we actually see a dog for a brief second. 
Alex, are you all right? It's just a... Alex, are you? What, what is this? You children will never learn. Perhaps being a callback to the messages within the caves, we end up getting possessed and see another flashback of several figures. This time another weird phenomenon occurs. Objects that have been taken from another point of time appear in front of us and we see a large radio. Alex chooses to talk to another timeline version of herself before the ghosts tell us not to hurt ourselves by trying. Hey, if you're out there, Alex, we, we got stranded on Edwards Island and do not hurt yourself with the stream of trying. There is no way out. Trying to do what exactly? Trying to exit the time loop? Ren seems to be happy when seeing us given that we chose to visit him first. The ghost talk to us and state that Anna tried what we are plotting. perhaps indicating that she attempted to close a time anomaly located in the caves, or perhaps tried to escape from her own time loop. The part that caught my interest is when we're told we are it by the ghost. Tag. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention the name, Oxenfree. Oli Oli Oxenfree is considered a truce term in kids games, sometimes used in hide and seek. It means that all participants of the game can come out of hiding without losing. Being told we are it further encapsulates the idea that this is all a repetitive game to the ghosts. In Fort Milner, we skip another small section of time. We see what appears to be a dog and a man when turning on the lights. See a man about a dog, perhaps? This time during the quiz segment, I'm able to get every answer right. We end up in a furnished room during the next time loop. We see a bunch of different equipment to use, and Alex gets the idea to contact herself from a different timeline. Um, a Alex? Can you... can you hear me? It won't be... So... easy. In the towel segment, I choose Ren to come with us, which causes Jonas to become quite angry. You're tired of? Keeping in mind who's taller, who do you want coming with you? Yeah, your oldest pal. Ren, you're up. Phew. I, uh, I didn't realize how much I had emotionally invested in that. Ren talks further to us and points out that he is also experiencing a time loop. So this might be coming out of nowhere for you, but do you feel at all like we've maybe kind of done this before when you're off the little machine has no more heart than a brain when you're off the little machine has no more heart than a brain could be referring to the fact that our decisions don't actually have any impact we're essentially in the state of autopilot when clarissa says the statement all the outs and free during the campfire time loop what do you all the outs and free this is once again referring to the phrase Oli Oli Oxen Free. We can create another time disturbance in the town where the car is located. On a brief side note, some have theorized that the island itself may have a triangular shape, acting as a time anomaly. Since we're the only people on the island, then perhaps that explains why the characters keep repeating events. It also explains why triangular shapes follow us at the end of the game because we haven't actually left the zone that the time anomaly effects. This scene with the time travel to Clarissa plays a bit differently. Clarissa talks about how a friend attempted to tune into the radio near the rocks, only for her to hear Alex. Oh, this is kind of... My sister came out a few weeks ago. She was trying to do the radio rocks thing or whatever, and she said she thought she heard you on the station. Do you know what that could have been? Or was she... Did she just mishear? She heard me? What was I, like, saying? She told me you were saying... Ah, uh, what was it? It was something like, Hey, Ren, Nona, can you guys hear me? It's Alex. It was like, Hey, if you're out there, we got stranded on Edwards Island. And then you said, You were saying something like, Hey, Alex, can you hear me? You were like, talking to yourself. 
the radio signals seem to go in between timelines. Jonas and Nona seem to be getting along when we return, making Ren quite jealous. Bet on whether or not we'd even make it back? Yeah, but not for money, for dinner. Dinner? Yeah, but like a fancy dinner. Steaks. Steaks? It doesn't matter what happened. During the game section that takes place in the house, I'm able to get all the answers correct. The ghosts say that there is a small possibility that one Alex, somewhere in the universe, would have escaped from the island. One in an infinite shot though. Maybe another Alex is having a better go of things. It's not out of the question. Not entirely. Wait, one in an infinite shot? What does that mean? Um, you just got the wrong roll of the dice this time, that's all. Pray for the doubles, that they don't make the same mistakes. We are identified as the unlucky Alex who was not able to escape. I didn't know what she was playing with, it doesn't matter. Do not have eternal recurrence. The waves, it's the waves we think. The knot may be a symbol of how things repeat themselves, with the ghost referring to it as the knot of eternal recurrence. Eternal recurrence, or eternal return, according to Wikipedia, is a philosophical concept which states that time repeats itself in an infinite loop, and that exactly the same events will continue to occur in exactly the same way, over and over and over again for eternity. Wait, wait, we just... I think we just time jumped. I think we... I don't know. We skipped, like, a bunch of stuff. Huh? No, we didn't. Yeah, we're okay. No one else seems to notice the minor time skips we experience. We're reminded of the death of our friend in one of the loops, and the ghosts treat the whole incident as a play we have to take part in. Maybe not all the little details, but... The death of a companion can't be that sad. Why keep doing this, Ben? Why keep... Why torture me? Why torture my friends? Try and... Try and take us over if you know it's not going to work. Alex, the rules are a little more complicated than you think, dear. It feels good to break script here, we'll admit. You and us, we played these parts for a long time, and we will continue to play them. Forever in a conscription by God. During the bunker scene, we find another radio. We tell Alex not to come to the island, potentially saving another version of ourselves within a different timeline. Alex, this is... Alex, and listen, don't come to Edward's Island. Whatever you do, just don't come here. Stay home. Stay safe. The final scene plays out again, and the ghosts identify how it is futile to reach out to another version of ourselves. Self? Well, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, sweetie, but the Alex out there, this hypothetical innocent creature who has yet to meet Jonas or be scared or lost, even if she hears it, it won't save you. Also, I didn't notice this the first time, but who is that? Is that Anna, forever stuck with the ghosts? This time in our time loop, back to Michael, I made sure to get Michael to stay. Just wave your hand over my head or something and say I'm alright to do this. <sighs> Michael, you you have a lot that you can do and a lot ahead of you and, and I don't think tying yourself to your high school girlfriend in such a risky way is the smart play here. This alters the timeline so that Michael comes back and Alex is surprised and shocked. <laughs> Finally, it's not like you've been up for much longer. Michael, how... What's happening? What's happening? Clarissa also seems to be in a more positive mood. Jonas in this timeline moved towns and became friends with Ren, who he brought along for the trip. In this ending, I stayed in contact with Ren and lost contact with Nona and Jonas. Michael and Clarissa end up together and Michael gets an engineering degree. Time repeats itself once more and it's possible that all our changes to the timeline may have had no actual effect. Suddenly, we cut back to an alternative timeline. We're asked to take out the radio where we hear this. Well, alright. I guess that means... <laughs> Whatever you do, just don't come here. Stay home. Stay, stay, stay. 
Ren believes the whole thing is a very elaborate prank. We haven't actually saved the original Alex who is still trapped on the island, but we managed to save Alex from a completely different timeline, preventing her from suffering the same fate. Looking at the photographs in the credit scene, we also see subtle changes in which Michael appears in some of them. An interesting little detail should you choose to get the ending where Michael comes back. Now that you understand all the major differences, I'll give you what I think is or was the true ending of the game. During the tower segment, I decide to bring Nona along with me, making Ren and Jonas angry. Keeping in mind who's taller, who do you want coming with you? Nona? Wanna come with me? What? Really? I mean, I guess. Why this are you isn't... making me shack up with it's this guy? It's my friggin' plan! Be quiet! Both of you! Talking to Nona, we apparently go to the same class as her, although we don't really talk to each other that much. Her birthday is in a few days, and she's also interested in ballet. Birthday, go. Jess, this was when Nicole was in a car accident, and so of course we cancel and go visit her, and I'm not gonna pout about that. It's common decency, it's fine. But afterwards, after this totally emotionally draining night, Clarissa still came over and surprised me with this huge cake. Apparently, the previous year when Nona's friend was in a car accident, Nona had to visit them instead of celebrating her birthday. Clarissa then visited Nona to make her feel better, explaining their close friendship. Nona ends up defending us during the campfire time loop. Jesus Christ, can't you be with me on this? I am with you, Clarissa. But, ugh, but we came here to do a thing, and that thing is going to get us home. So, let's get home. No. Uh, Clarissa, what are you- All the outs in free. During the scene at the beach, I tell Michael to dump Clarissa. You want my unvarnished truth? I think you should dump her. Really? Why's that? Why's that? Because I think she's mean. Because I think she's a bully. Because she likes to get her way. Because I guess that's it. Well, you see her more than I do. She's in your class. To make everyone hate us, we can tell our friends that we traded in Clarissa for the ghosts. I'll admit, as fun as I had going the mean route, this part made me wince a little bit. But, um, the bad news is I kind of sort of gave them Clarissa for the trouble. What? I don't believe this. How could you do that? Oh, come on. It was, it was just the numbers alone. Leave behind the fact that she was miserable. Shut up. I don't care what you say. I don't, I don't care what deal you made. The night, it's, it's not over. We still have time. Hit the damn button and open the stupid door. You're gonna correct this when we get back to the shelter. During the time loop back to the island, we find out that Michael ended up breaking up with Clarissa as a result of our advice. Oh, and just so you know, I uh, took your advice about Clarissa. I'm not gonna see her anymore. I don't know. I don't oh, know. sorry. It's okay, I think she's great, but maybe there wasn't enough something there and she's depressed all the time i really didn't want this to make it worse <sighs> come on let's get to the sentry before the last boat comes we get confronted by nona and ren with nona being especially mad at us first you kill your own brother and now you bump off clarissa because what she doesn't sit with you at lunch you dye your hair because you pretend to be sad hey i'm not shut up shut up when i'm talking i'm talking now now is the part of the video where I get all the secret notes and radio frequencies. After getting the first Adler note, which tells us about a so-called hidden truth surrounding the island, we unlock the ability to collect further notes, allowing us to piece together what happened. We can also use the radio where the rocks are located to unlock more hidden details. Here's the story of Maggie Adler. Note 1 suggests that Adler accepted an army recruitment offer while she was in college, despite her family's protests. In 1975, she petitioned for a statue of a soldier to be made. Although most recruits learned about code breaking, Adler was considered so talented at maths and engineering that she was offered to help design the codes. The name Francis gets mentioned a lot. He was an engineer who talked frequently to Adler. Adler notes her increasing discomfort with hiding government secrets, but continues due to her interest in radio communications. 
Adler returned from a reading of her father's will. During the submarine incident, the engineer Francis sent the Kenaloa's distress signal, which had been cut off. Adler interprets this as an attempt to jam radar, and she sends an approval to scout and bomb the submarine if necessary. Adler blamed her father for several years after this. Further details are told about the submarine sinking in the fourth note. On October 25th, 1943, the USS Kanaloa was destroyed by friendly fire from the USS Walter Roy. Only a few people ended up knowing the truth about the explosion, and Adler notes how one of the weapons technicians was at Francis's wedding. On another important note, the submarine that was destroyed held a developmental nuclear reactor, possibly explaining the time anomalies taking place. Adler explains how she first discovered the possibility of the ghosts on the radio. Soon after the accident, many soldiers reported hearing childlike voices on radio frequencies. After Adler deciphers one of the messages to be a mayday from Calvin Gilbert, an electrician killed on the submarine, she begins investigating further. The sixth note tells us that Adler worked with a skeptical woman named Mary Ann Bozek to decipher the ghost messages. Adler then found out that it was her actions which resulted in the deaths of everyone on the submarine. The seventh note tells us that Adler convinced her higher-ups to let her friend Anna come work with her, much to her regret. The nuclear explosion that took place may have caused the soldiers to be separated from their dimension. The soldiers apparently act like children, which Adler describes as the use of game logic. On April 4th, 1952, they would attempt to bring the soldiers back. Otherwise, the rest of the ninth letter explains how they came to attempt communications with the ghosts. Anna, Adler's best friend, went with her to a cave in order to communicate with a spirit by the name of Henry Griffin. Anna gets absorbed into the time fracture and Adler explains how the only evidence of the ghost's existence is a flickering hue. Anna's last memory before she is taken is of Adler running away in fear. Adler used her father's resources to buy most of Edwards Island. To her horror, a small tourist industry is set up and so she decides to have a gate built outside the cave. The twelfth note is hidden near the beach and Adler informs the reader that she hid the notes for the correct person and not for, as she puts it, the easily distracted military mind or the bewildered excursionist. The last note is the one we find in the main story which introduces us to the trail. That's quite a lot to work with. Adler in this whole thing isn't exactly the best person. She unknowingly caused the deaths of those on the submarine, communicated with them, allowing them into her dimension, and then let Anna get trapped for all eternity to be with the ghosts. During the final segment, we get scolded by Nona and Ren if we tell them about our plan to trade in Clarissa in order to save everyone else. We can also refuse to help Jonas listen to his mother's voice. What you're about to see is what I think to be the true ending from our original timeline. In this ending, we can actually close the time hole. We're then left to suffer for all eternity. The ghosts even sympathize with you, effectively telling you that you're trapped in a sort of limbo. Now the weird part is we end up back on the boat. So what exactly does being trapped in limbo mean? Well, you see, there isn't a happy ending. The ghosts want to escape because they have to experience the death over and over again, hence the deal to keep Clarissa. But in the original timeline, Alex decided to close off the time hole using her radio, explaining why no matter what we do, we can't ever escape. We already closed the hole, but just don't remember it, meaning none of our decisions 
matter or have any importance, as we have to continuously repeat the events of the island for all of eternity. 